welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast that explores Christian faith and practice and email from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I am the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jamie Fowler, executive pastor at Redeemer Fellowship. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, 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 hey. What is going on, man? Nothing. What's going on with you? You know, it's a, this is dropping on a Thursday, so mm-hmm. it's end of the week, which means tomorrow is my day off. So nice. I'm in the process of trying to find a vehicle for my son Ooh. because his other one got totaled. So now we're looking, and uh, yeah, it's not. Uh, I'm finding decent cars, but I'm not finding a way to. All these people that are selling cars, like on Facebook Marketplace and whatnot, I'm like, yeah, man, I want to come in and see it. And they're like, okay, Monday after 6 p.m. And I'm like, well, I got to take it to my mechanic, so I need to see it before that. I need to see it like at four. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like a 10 minute, like once over, they're going to do. Just like, I need, you know, nothing. So, which is shady. Yep. So, anyway. Yeah, struggling, trying to get trying to get him a car, you know, trying to get him a job. Homeboy doesn't have a job yet. What? So weird, man. He's just like, nah, I'll get to it. I'm like, no. So I just told him what I told him. I said, guess what? I'm gonna go get you a job and you're gonna take that job because uh we're done, we're done playing. Uh it's, yeah, how old is he? What he, he's 17. Graduated? No, 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 no. He's, he's gonna year. be a senior. Yeah. But I listen, I lied and said I was 16 to get a job at Taco Bell. They never checked. I wanted, I wanted to get a, I wanted to work and make money. Well, I'm looking for stackers if he wants to work for the summer. For real? Yeah. You got to be there by five. It's 5 a.m. to, you know. All right. What does it pay? Huh? I'm not going to tell it on air. 20, no. 20 an hour. I'm not giving that 20 an hour. <laughs> not giving that kid 20. Listen, Biden will give him 20 to sit at home. <laughs> you know what's funny is I went to my old work, uh, Suburban Tire, and I was talking to the guys there. They all know me from back in the 80s. And uh, they was like, hey, man, do you, your son's looking for a job. He's like, we'll hire him here. I was like, really? And he's like, does he have experience? And I said, no. And he goes, oh, well, okay, with no experience? Yeah, like 13 an hour. I'm like, that's yeah. great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Like, all right. Like, I'm like, told him about it. And he's like, well, I don't know how to do it. I'm like, that's the, yeah, you don't know how to do anything until you learn how to do it. I, I got the same job at 16. I left Taco Bell, went to Suburban Tire, didn't know how to change the tire on my car. I went in. I said, I, I, got, I would like this job. And George Kudelik was like, he was like, can you can you do it? I mean, you're a tiny guy. I was like 119 pounds. I'm mm-hmm. like, I can do anything if you show me. I can figure it out. Don't worry about it. So yeah, they trained me for an hour and then just turned me loose and I was fine. Love that job. Paid mm. good back then too. Still pays pretty good. Well, it's only Monday to Thursdays. So it gets Friday off. Ooh, okay. I'm not talking about it today, uh, but it's a summer job. It ends at a certain point or could it continue? That's How? School year. He can. No. Well, oh, because you'd be there at five. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Summer's almost over. All right. So, yeah, I'll talk to him about it and then uh, I'll what, get back to you. What a baby. But what are you, what's going on with you? You said something to me earlier. You're, what? Le- you're leaving or somewhere? Where are you going? Well, I am. I guess I'll be leaving today. Thursday. Thursday. Where are you going? Do you really want me to tell yeah, you? Yeah, well, I know where you're going. Just going to go on a little trip, weekend trip. Are you going to see the fights? Yes. Another fight trip that I'm not invited you, on. You're preaching. Bro, if you give me any notice at all, I'll plug somebody else in. I, there's no way I can give you notice. Mm. Do you know why? Why? Because I just got notice of the tickets three days ago. McGregor's not fighting on this one, is he? He is. I hate you so much right <laughs> it's now. It's McGregor Porter. I hate number three, right? Yeah. It's the third fight. Oh, I hate you Listen. so much. Listen. You know what? Nobody else is going with you, right? <laughs> you are the worst friend ever. How Dude, are you such a bad no way, friend? There's no way you could go. I could go. How? Dude, if I told you three I'll days call ago. A professor from Moody to come in and preach. Okay. Yeah. Call a professor. No, I can't do that. See? No. I mean, I could do that. <laughs> no, he, he, <laughs> yeah. So three days ago. Yeah, I got okay. noticed three days yeah, ago. Whatever. That I was going to get okay, a ticket. But like, even like two weeks ago was... No, 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 in no. In back of your mind, was it a possibility? Uh, yes, yeah, no. so you should have been told. Yeah, it was. Yeah, no. It totally was. Yeah. No, it wasn't. Yeah, totally, it definitely totally wasn't. Was. Uh, just tell me it's not Greg. You're not taking Greg with you, right? See, this is this is why. This is this is the stress fracture in our relationship right no, here. You're, you're welcome to come. I just didn't. Re- well, if I can find a ticket. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I got to get you a ticket. <laughs> Okay, and I know he's on your legal team or whatever. Like it's well, fine. yeah, and I've got. Well, see, here's the thing: I might have a free ticket. I might have a free <laughs> ticket because the I'm supposed to be bringing the guys from England clients or no, 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 no a couple. Oh employees. yeah, people that work for you in England. Correct, yeah. but because of the presidential proclamation, uh, Biden won't allow anyone coming in from the UK. Come on, man. Yeah, so. <laughs> so we actually had to, you know, uh, petition the the embassy in London. Yeah. 
and actually our, our local congresswoman mm. is also involved. Wait a minute. I'm not preaching next week. Tim Smith is. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. What? Tim Smith is preaching next week. Where are you doing? What are you doing? Chilling. You're li- no, there's no, no way no, I no. could go. There's no way. I could go. See? No, I, I mean, mean I could go. There's no there's it. there's no ticket. There's no No, no I I don't think he's going to get across. We haven't heard anything yet. Right. I'll keep you updated. All right. I will keep you updated. All right. But are you serious? I'm 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 100%. Let me look I, it up right now. Yeah, you better look it up I'm because look I'm up. not going to do this and then all of a sudden, all right, hang on. Not and you obviously didn't want me to go. No, because so I feel bad going, no, you, I, you know. You know, I knew you couldn't yeah, go. No, you know, you didn't want me to. That's fine. That's fine. I, I, I'm like, I'm You're like, being a baby. I'm the B team friend. Okay, You're being it's, a it's baby. Fine. All right, hang on. Sermon series. I got to open this up in our, in our thing. Here. John Jones agent is, you know, giving us some tickets. All right, hang on. So what's the today? Okay. Two beasts. All right. This is me. Revelation 13. Uh, one through 18. Tim Smith, 7-Eleven on forgiveness. Okay, we'll see. Maybe, maybe I will be with Jimmy right now. Yeah, maybe, maybe. And Greg, he's not so bad. He he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> he's the guy. He's the guy. So here's what I appreciate about you, Joe. Yeah, you will bring that bag. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yo, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm looking at his backpack. Yeah, my backpack. Yeah, Greg will bring a carry on and a backpack. A roller carry on, and, and I'll say this for a weekend trip. You. And I'm, I don't mean this as an insult. Oh, you are a bit of a dandy uh, in that you like your shoes yeah, and your nice yeah, shirts yeah. and all that. You do not pack large. You no. pack conservatively yep. and you know exactly what to bring. Yep. One carry on. I, I, know how, I know how to mix and match. Yep. 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 Same pants, nope. different shirt, different mm-hmm. shoes, socks. I got okay. it. Yeah. No, I don't play around like no, that. No, no. Okay. So, and I know I could put one other pair of shoes because I'm wearing one. Yes. Yeah, right. So I wear one, put one mm-hmm. and then I can, duh, 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 duh. Mm-hmm. I can build from there. Totally. I can get a week's worth of clothes in a backpack. And I'm not talking about one of those big- Yeah, giant four, like expedition. I'm not looking at, I'm not talking about the 38 liter ones. Right. I'm talking, give me my 24 liter one that I have now. Like a high school backpack. It's a little yeah. bit larger than that, but yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a Jansen little, backpack. But I could get a week out of that. And a trapper keeper. And mm-hmm. because I always do, like my trips are like a week here, a week there. Yeah. I, I All I have to also bring is, I just go to the laundromat. And I just wash everything. Yeah. And then I repack it. I'm good for the next week. All right. All right. Well, if if this if we're able to work this out, if I can get a ticket, all if we I can do it, let's see what's going on then, with Mark. Uh, I just gotta see right. what's going on with Mark. All right. Hey, Mark. And everyone else getting. You know, I got I'm praying it. against you coming. Let's do some emails. <laughs> let's do it. All right. First email. Man, Thursdays got. are becoming email Thursday, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we get a lot of emails, but they don't all require a response. Um, and then sometimes we just kind of offhandedly mention one. Sometimes we'll send a response back if we can. Uh, but okay, you know what? It's uh, these are these are good subjects. Oh, and I was hitting on this one on was it Tuesday? Was it Tuesday or Monday? I, might have been. I don't know. I don't know. But Which, uh, you know. this one basically is arguing that we're a little too soft, a little too a little too nice uh, on the Ed Litton thing. Um, why don't you read it? I didn't feel he was saying you were too kind, but yeah. I don't think he was saying we're soft. Well, he, he said you were too kind on Ed Litton, which means we're you're too soft on. Ed All right, Litton. let's read the thing. Yeah, oh, read okay, okay. He's not being mean. No, he's not. Mm-hmm. Listener from Australia. I'm the pastor of a small evangelical church in a regional city of about 40,000 people. I've been encouraged by your podcast over the years, especially through some difficult seasons of ministry. Awesome. While it has next while it has next to nothing to do with me, I am very grieved by the plagiarism scandal engulfing Pastor Litton. His behavior really is an insult to ordinary pastors of smaller churches who have a tenth of the resources. It is dishonoring to God and to his congregation. I can't understand why he hasn't been sacked, which means fired, from all the offices that he holds. It really is that serious. You were too kind in your discussion on the podcast. Your brother in Jesus. Uh, you don't have to explain yeah. sacked. Sacked is also an American term. People, people don't understand that. Yeah, people understand You don't sacked. understand yeah, everybody, it. You, know, no. you don't have to be the preacher here explaining the Greek of sacked, okay? Sackos. Uh, <laughs> or sack A, I guess it might be. Um, okay, well, okay. A couple of things. One on the front end. Let's just say this. We have two episodes on the Litton thing. So I don't know if he listened to the first one and not the second one, but in the second, because in the first one, we're dealing with one sermon. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we don't jump to conclusions. We always try to be fair and and kind and understanding yep, yep, as yep, much yep, as we yep. can. Uh, second one, when we have more information, I think we were, we said a lot more. We were so, ap- appropriately pressing. Yeah, I think I think we pressed in. And a lot of people really appreciate that. We got a lot of response to that. Um, they were really grateful that we did it again, that we yeah. went back to it. They were grateful for that so um i actually have one thought here that might be a little 
Oh. Um, oh, here we go. Here, here's the thing. Is this scandalous? No, no, but he might not like hearing it. Oh, what? If I was your mentor, if I was your coach, if I was your discipler, and I, I got this email or you were talking to me about this, one of the things I would be cautioning you against is pride. Because you're right, this has nothing to do with you. This bears no relevance to your life. And the fact that you are laboring and somebody else isn't, isn't a reason for you to be upset. It's like, you, I would be concerned. And I know this is not the whole of it, and I'm not coming down on you. I'm just saying, like, I would watch that. I would guard that because... the. If, if this is a real problem, your primary motivation, your primary grief should be that God is dishonored, not that like you are insulted, not that like, hey, listen, I work really hard and you're getting away with copying somebody else's sermons. To me, and I, I said this in part on one of the other episodes, I don't think that that is that serious of a grief. It doesn't impact you. It has nothing to do with you. So I would just, I would, I would caution against, I would caution you to like, just examine your heart. Um, you know, like, Hey, I'm working really hard. He's not. So why? So what? I don't understand why that would, it, I don't think it should. I mean, listen, I can say this, like, you know, we, we pastor a, a mid-sized church, so maybe it's, it's, it's larger than yours, but like I'm laboring in the word. I don't copy other people's sermons, but what some other preacher is doing and copying another sermon doesn't bother me because I'm working hard and he's not because it's not about me and it's not about you. It's about the task of preachers. It's about the responsibility of pastors. So, but is it, is it an, though, because uh, an issue because this guy is the head of the SBC? No, that, that's, that's a separate issue. Okay. He, he is making an appeal to like, listen, this is an insult to me as a pastor. I work hard. I have a 10th of the resources. I'm doing all this work and he's, he has more resources. He's not doing the work. I, 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 oh, yes, yes. I understand what you're getting at. I do think it's insulting. It is insulting, I, yeah. but who cares? Deal with it. Like, it's not, that's, listen, that's, that's not a, that's not a reason to be all up in arms and, and not that he is, but that's not a reason to be up in arms and angry about this. It, to be up in arms about it is because, hey, listen, you are a preacher, you are a leader, you have a responsibility to do your job and you haven't been doing your job. You've been letting somebody else do your job for you and you're taking credit See, for it. See, I don't it. think you understand, like, how, Australians communicate. Oh, okay. I think that's yeah, the issue. Okay. So when he says sacked, you no, understand what he's okay. saying? So sacked, he, um, he means uh, uh, like elevated? To, to let go, to oh, fire. fire. He's gonna, yes, 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 yes. And I think also, like, you know, should he be fired? Uh, like Jimmy and I talked about this. Like, listen, if I was doing this, then I would be put on leave. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be an investigation. Yep. Uh, we would deal with it. We, they would definitely be asking... Like, I think you need to reassess your call. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, is this, did you get yourself into a bad way that you can come back from? Uh, it's not an automatic firing, I don't think, uh, it, but it could be, it could lead to a firing. But yeah, you, you definitely do would want to look at it. And it's complicated when you're talking about like, what does he do as, you know, the president of the SBC? Should he step down? I, man, honestly, I just don't know what's right. It, it's like, I'm conflicted because on the one hand, it's embarrassing Mm -hmm. It's so embarrassing as a Southern Baptist. So it does affect me as a Southern Baptist. It, it's embarrassing. It doesn't make us look very good when, when the, when Newsweek is posting this stuff and it's, then it's repeated on the Washington post and in other places. Yeah, it, it's definitely a problem. And, and anyone in the world is, is savvy enough to go like, yeah, he shouldn't be doing that. He should not be doing that thing that he's doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or that thing that he did. So I get you. We feel you. We don't feel like we gave him a pass at all. So be sure to check out our second episode on this Thursday episode if you haven't. Uh, but at the same time, I would just say just guard your heart that you're not taking an offense personally when it doesn't involve you and that that isn't the main thing that's upsetting you because that could be a symptom of pride. I would say this to my best friend. I would say this to anybody who is like leading with that. Um, however, I want to affirm it is a problem, a big problem. It needs to be dealt with. I'm not exactly sure what to do at a convention level. I'm still thinking through that, but uh, I feel you totally feel you. All right, Joe, what about TV Jesus? All right, this guy, Dan sent in. And are you ready to reprimand him? Uh, well, if he says something stupid, All right, here we go. Okay. <laughs> he says, Oh, look at that. Men. I like men. That. Instead of, Hey guys, men. Oh, hang on. I got to put my glasses. Old man can't read. 
He says, I enjoy historical fiction when done well. I think it can be a good and interesting way to learn some background on different periods of history while having an obviously fictional main story that draws you in. By the way, The Alienist, the book, not the TV show, The Alienist, great story, uh, late 19th century, really cool. I like some historical fiction as well, uh, but he's talking about Christianism. Books like The Lost Letters of Pergamum by Bruce Longnecker or A Week in the Life of Corinth by Ben Witherington, hey, I know that guy, uh, do things like this well. But my question is about when it, when it involves Jesus. A lot of times when a movie is made about Jesus, they try to add in some extra biblical details to help you get some kind of background picture of the situation. That's fine when done well and in small increments. But recently, I heard about this show, The Chosen. And if you're on Facebook and the internet and you're Christian, you've probably seen ads for this thing all over the place. Anyway. Uh, which is a show about Jesus and his disciples. I've tried it out to see what the deal is, and when they depict a biblical story, it seems they do a pretty good job. The problem is that it seems a good bit of it, if not most of it, is not depicting biblical stories, but mostly the fiction side of the, quote, historical fiction. And these not only involve the disciples or other people around, but Jesus himself saying things that are not in Scripture and doing things that are not in Scripture. My question is, is this a violation of the second commandment? Would be interested to hear your thoughts, Dan. Okay. So what did you just do? What was that? Hmm? What was that? What was that head movement? Trying to follow. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. So let's say this. All right. The Chosen. The Chosen. I've not seen it. Have you seen it? I've seen pieces of it. Not All impressed. Right. Oh, just because of quality yeah, or because of- okay, wrong. Right. Yeah. All right, so nothing theological, nothing... Oh, no, I, well, I would get into that, but okay. I, because I haven't watched it. I don't think that this is a Second Commandment violation. Many Reformed people would disagree that any visual depiction of Jesus is a violation of the Second Commandment. I think they are misguided. I think they are misinterpreting and misunderstanding the Second Commandment. Um, just by having a visual representation of Jesus, I don't think it violates that. I'm with R.C. Sproul on this. We'll see. So could it be, is the be difference wrong. between, like, praying to it or what's the difference yeah a visual representation in and of itself of jesus is not wrong you're giving a visual uh, representation of uh the, the god man uh in his incarnated form mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh once you begin to use it inappropriately for veneration for worship and things like that it then does become inappropriate in my mind uh but merely having a jesus storybook bible is not a violation however i would say like a precious moments jesus would be uh, a violation of the third commandment because I think precious moments, you know, turning Jesus into basically some sort of super white anime uh, <laughs> is is t treating him trivially. So I think it's a third mm. commandment violation. So I, I would look at this and say like it's it, it could be a third commandment violation, but for me, you, you, I would not be playing with Jesus in film and giving him words to say that are not in scripture. I am very uncomfortable with that. Um, and, you know, historical fiction can have its place. But again, when we're talking about the word of God and the son of God, I don't want to play. I'm just not about it. So, yeah, I think I think I feel you on this. I think that um, whether or not it's a violation of the second commandment, I think it's very problematic uh, and potentially dangerous. Because at that point, you are giving people an understanding of Jesus based on things that are not in the word. Mm. I do not believe we should be giving anybody any understanding of Jesus that is not directly yeah, yeah, from yeah, the yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can speculate on like, oh, well, you know, disciples during that time or people during that time. That's different. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely not about it. So don't play with Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> please. TV Jesus ain't Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. TV Jesus, uh, maybe not. Maybe just maybe just avoid that. I'll tell you what, uh, Passion of the Christ had some problems, but um, but by and large, I thought it was an interesting and compelling story. Um, and so maybe I need to go back and watch it because it's been a long time. I only saw it one time. Hmm. Um, I d definitely, there were some Roman Catholic things in there that were you know mystical and kind of weird. But uh, yeah, I would have to go back and see that. So again, if they're putting words in Jesus' mouth that are not in Scripture, not, don't like it. That would be my bottom line. Here we go. Next one. Loving God in Seminary. Frank Russell. I think I met Frank. I think I met Frank in O'Hare. Okay. Oh, 
Why'd you just sigh? Sorry. Because you 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 leave such pregnant pauses in between <laughs> statements. Like it's like you could I met Frank. Okay. There's another one. Ed O'Hare. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. I think it was when Michelle and I were heading to France. And uh, I think he was heading to France too. I'm gonna Google. This is interesting because Jimmy has really good recall of meeting people and where he met them and all that. And I don't remember anything. I right, want you read it while I look it up. I'm all see. right. Here's what Frank says. Hey guys. Hey guys. Hope you're doing well. I've been listening to the Doc and Devo. Do, I'm sorry, to Doc and Devo since the early days. I was a sophomore in college in 2016 when it all started, and I'm incredibly blessed by your godly wisdom and insight. And I'm grateful for the time. Yep. Found it on his Instagram. He Holy took a picture. Cow, look how young he is. <laughs> that must have been back in the college. Days. That was back. Yeah, yeah. He was got married. Uh, uh, you were Frank. Frank, you were going to go see your girlfriend there. Became your fiance. You're now married. Wow. Bam. And Jimmy, look how young you look. You're so know. old now. Shut oh up. my god, dude. There's no gray. Your beard looks like it has tinsel from a Christmas tree in it now. Look See? at that. Man, are you come on. You're kind of impressed with I, that. I just admitted before you even show, showed it uh, that I was always impressed. All right, go ahead. Keep going. All right, so here's what he says. Uh, grateful for the time you both spend in teaching God's word and equipping the saints. I just recently started my MDiv, and the seminary I go to is very heavily into the very academic side of biblical studies. Good. While I appreciate this immensely... And the depth of study we do is great. I sometimes grow frustrated as I feel like the content that is discussed in class is almost being presented as the only way to truly know the Bible is if you dig deep into the historical and cultural backgrounds of the stories. While I think it's necessary to study these to better understand the meaning of the text, I'm nervous of the implications it has for the everyday Christian. Am I supposed to believe that the devoted followers of Jesus who do not intensely study scriptures like academics do truly don't understand the Bibles that they read? Good question. Would love your input on this and your thoughts on this and the importance of understanding the authorial intent of the Bible. Secondly, would love your advice on ways of getting through seminary that help an individual grow closer to Christ rather than grow frustrated. Sometimes I read my Bible after class and feel as if my joy has been stolen as I think of all the various views presented rather than just sit and bask in God's glory through his word. Again, appreciate you both and keep doing what you're doing. Frankie Frank Frank. Frankity, Frank, Frank, Frank. Good stuff, man. And and good questions. Let us know. I actually sent him an email. Hey, what seminary are you going to? Because I'm, I'm curious. Um, let us know what seminary you're going to. And uh, yeah, so listen, when you're studying at a Bible college or a seminary, uh, if it's a good one, yeah, it's going to be academic. They're going to yep. press you hard yep. to study the languages. And, you, and you're going to get pushed on views that you disagree with. Which is great. Yep. You want to be fighting against and looking into bad views and interpretations of scripture it makes you sharper it makes you it makes you a better theologian uh so long as you don't lose your way in the process um okay so on this first question this idea that you really can't understand the scripture unless you get deep into the historical background material um and does this mean then that people like in the pews who don't have this education can't understand the bible i would say this i would say um the Bible translated into the language of the people can be understood. In fact, mm. if you are if you are familiar with the scripture as a whole, you'll have a pretty good grasp on its individual parts. In other words, if you just if you if you get saved and you stay in Romans, a lot of that's not going to make sense. You need to go Genesis through Revelation. You need to be reading that thing. Yep. This is why Baptists who historically when they emerged in the 17th century, uh, Baptists didn't have uh, a lot of formal education. We didn't have the the infrastructure infrastructure built up that other denominations did, and yet because we were such a people of the book, we became ballers with the Bible. Like we knew how to understand and interpret the Scripture. That's why our children were so well catechized and educated. Now, I so I, on the one hand, yes, I think you're right to to have this question or this concern. Hey, I don't want people to think in the in the church that they can't understand the Word. At the same time, God has ordained that there be teachers and preachers mm -hmm. in the church mm -hmm. for this reason. Yes. That we need to be taught. We need help. We need people that are educated and schooled and studied in this so that they can help the entire congregation move forward. Yep. So both are true. Uh, you know, uh, let's say like uh, Redeemer Ralph, to use like a Saddleback Sam kind of a thing. Okay, so okay. Redeemer Ralph, who uh, is a five-year-old Christian and never went to any kind of Bible college and never took any classes, can read the word and understand it. It's perspicuous, Luther would say, right? It's clear. And the more you understand of the whole of scripture, the more you can understand its parts. But at the same time, 
yeah, you do. You definitely do need teachers and preachers to help you uh, work through because, you know, as Peter says, uh, some things in the scripture are hard to understand. Mm-hmm. See Paul. Yeah. That's what Peter says. <laughs> like, yeah, some things, yeah, like Paul. Uh, some things are easier. Some things are harder. What about, what about this other, this other thing about, you know, maintaining a robust, healthy spirituality and communion with God uh, and a love for the word while you're going through all of the academic, what can be viewed or experienced as sterile study of dissecting scripture. Yeah. I think that's where, um, learning to, I guess, shut that part off, but it's not even like shutting it off. Like in the sense of, cause a lot of times we read and we begin to, uh, so even still now as I'm reading and as I'm doing my devotions, I'll still start to get like different lessons, I guess, or different, uh, things that I've read in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of that has, instead of fighting against it, right. Instead of fighting against it, I've used it, I think to appreciate God's word more. Yeah. Right? Um, that careful study should, I, I would say help unlock and deepen, you know, our, our study. And so as we're getting deeper, um, I think I've grown more of an appreciation for God's word. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, what I, cause I went through this in Bible college. I went to Moody Bible Institute where, um, the Bible definitely became a tool that I used more than it was the word of God that gave me life. That definitely happened. Um, I came in on fire for Jesus, loving the Bible. I uh, feel like I was excited. I had a lot of problems, but I mean, and then over the years that I was there, I became more arrogant, spiritually cold, though I didn't recognize it at the time. And I basically used the Bible to footnote my theology. It's basically mm-hmm. what I was doing. It became a text to dissect. And, uh, and it was at the at the back end of my time at Moody when I was getting ready to go to seminary that God really began convicting me about this. So when I wound up in seminary, which is where you are, Frank, I made a commitment that um, uh, I am. Well, first of all, I said I'm going to keep my mouth shut and not make. I'm just going to focus on my understanding of God and His Word and my relationship with Christ. Uh, I'm not in this to debate and get a lot of that at Moody. Also, it was I disagreed with seventy percent of what was taught at Moody and ten percent of what was taught at at Southern. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I kept my mouth shut. I I I committed to finding men that I could pray with on the regular and read some books with. We read Matthew Henry's "The Pleasantness of a Religious Life," for example. Um, so I looked for community. I looked for fellowship. Uh, we looked for a church to really plug into, though at the time there wasn't a lot of options that I felt like were good fits or healthy for us. And I wound up pastoring or preaching a lot and then pastoring a church while I was in seminary. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely uh, guard your heart. Uh, look at every assignment and every class as an opportunity to help you to better understand the God that you know and love and worship. Like whatever it is. Like it could be a class on... A sociology of of worship in not the 1950s like if you're taking some weird class like that like okay mm. so then how is this going to impact your understanding or your experience of 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 worship today like i i would constantly be pressing myself mm-hmm. in this like what what do i need to know what do i need to do so that this is not just an academic discipline but how is it going to impact me yeah. as a as a man and then therefore help me minister to other people it's good miss you frank frankie frank frank we were supposed to meet up in france but we couldn't meet up in france but we we're both there at the same time oh. i do remember that so we but we yeah probably we didn't let him into your bougie hotel oh i'm sorry villa <laughs> well they, they, the next one, they only have one apartment up on top of the eiffel tower yeah and that was uh jimmy's takes you know he likes to spread out <laughs> no guests all right, this one's for you. Read the last email. All right, here we go. I'm glad you're reading this one. Go for it. Yeah, I just saw the PS. What? I hate you. <laughs> go. You, you had me read. Listen, I was going to be reading this one. You changed it up. Go ahead. How did I change it up? You said you read this while you search for Frank on the internet. Oh, you're right. Mm-hmm. All right, that's on me. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys. <laughs> A long time listener. First, wanted to say I find the egalitarianism within your podcast marriage to be inspiring as we move past the patriarchal heteronormativity. Heteronormativity. Yeah, heteronormativity <laughs> of our culture. <laughs> to be honest, 
there are times I find it hard to distinguish which one of you is truly the podcast wife. All right. Steve's got jokes. The reason for my writing is I'm currently a lay pastor at a small church in Ohio, and I'm wanting to learn more about the role of an executive pastor. I have listened to the episode you did with Tyler Druitz on pastoral roles, and I have looked around at my XP's website. This is a need that is becoming more and more apparent in our little church, and we are looking for insight, information, and resources on this topic. We have a plurality of elders with a lead pastor in place. We are seeking to strengthen the effectiveness of our elder team and take weight off of our lead pastor, thus enabling him to focus his attention more on preaching, teaching, and counseling. I would love to hear you guys riff on this topic and maybe get some book, podcasts, and article suggestions. Thanks, Steve. P.S. Jimmy is the podcast wife, but I'd like to think of him as the podcast I gave. Oh, a double slam. Dang. Not you. only are you the podcast wife, you're dressed as, as Robin. Yeah. Which means I'm bad man. Nice. Yeah, I'm really I'm really enjoying the segment. This, this, this came at a this came at a good time because the last reference I saw was a guy on Twitter saying that uh nobody tunes in to the podcast for Joe. They everybody tunes in for Jimmy. That was on Twitter. Oh, uh, why can't I read that one? I'm not showing you that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm showing you this. All right, all right. So Executive pastor, Jimmy. Executive pastor. Here we go. So the question essentially is, um, what what is the value? Okay, everybody can stop freaking out about the name. I know some people are like, we don't need executive. Okay, fine. Like, don't worry about the name. This is not a business. Triggered babies. We just mean it's it's a particular role just of call an it elder. Administrative pastor. I don't know why they just don't call it administrative. Well, administrative. What is administrative? All right. So what what are the strengths? Because we're going to assume executive pastor is a shepherd of the people, minister of the word, all mm -hmm, that stuff. Mm -hmm. Same pastors are elders, elders are pastors, all the same. But yep. the strengths and the, maybe some of the focuses or foci, foci of the executive pastor, Jimmy, go. I would say uh, more organizational. Wrong. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so Starting off so bad. <laughs> Yeah, more organizational yes. leadership. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of administrative tasks, just, uh, uh, systems oriented. Um, why? Do, who cares? Why does it matter? Why? Is, why does systems? Because like I know some of these reform guys are like oh systems. What are you talking? I don't see systems in the Bible. What are you talking about when you say? Systems? Well, I don't know. I mean, things in order. Like you know, I mean, oh, doing um, things all in order. Doing yeah. things, yes, because our God is not a God of chaos, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, yeah, there there has to be some sort of system in place to handle things in an orderly way. As a church grows, it becomes more complex, more people, more issues, more communication uh, needs to happen, and so everything needs to be a bit more centralized and direct. And so, with systems in place, you're then helping shepherd your people. Uh, or just individuals from first time visitors, right? Yeah. To committed members of the body. Yeah. Growing members of the body. Uh, and it's not about growing the church, but it's about the individual. And and so the systems you're play, you're putting in place is helping them move from point A to point B to C, D, E, all the way to Z. Uh, or Z, because we're not in any other country but America. We're just trying to help get there. Okay. You know. Yeah, I, I like that because... The whole idea like, hey, is we want to make a disciple. Okay, well, how do you make a disciple? As soon as you start to outline something, that's organization. That's a process. That's a system. That's a process. That's a like, flow chart. Why are you guys? I mean, listen, I, I I love I love my reform guys, but like I'm I'm, I'm one of you. Like I'm a reform Baptist, anyways. Uh, but you all, oh, man, I honestly, you just sound silly when you start doing this. When you start getting all up in arms about like, what do you need a vision? Like, look, we're talking about an articulation of the mission for a church. And then that will then include how we carry out the mission. Mm -hmm. Like, what are, you, what are you complaining about? Now, obviously, there are really bad examples of this. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about good examples of this. So, yeah, if you're going to make disciples, if you're going to handle a conflict. OK, so what are the steps that we that we take uh, when there is a conflict? Right. Do you just do you just like tell somebody who's bringing a charge against an elder, shut up and know your place and get back in line or we're going to excommunicate you? Like some churches do. Yeah. Or do you have a process like, hey, we want to hear you. We want to understand. We're going to do an investigation. Yep. What happens when you have uh, a, a, some sort of a claim of, of, of sexual abuse or mishandling of money? You better have a system in place or you're not going to know what you're doing. Yep. And maybe by God's grace, you'll walk through it and get it right. But uh, but Jimmy's right. The bigger it is, the more complicated things are. If you've got a church of 30 to 50 people, because I've been there, I've done that. Um, I've had a, Listen, I've had a church less than 30 people. So like I actually do know what that's like. Um like it, it's hard, it's difficult, but it's not as complicated. And so in that sense, it doesn't mean that things are easy, but things are simpler 
than they are when you have a larger congregation. And so it's a bit easier to manage in an organic way. But once you start to have a lot of people, you really have to have systems in place. You got to have a plan. You got to have a means by which you know what um, you should be doing next. Mm. So in what way does an executive pastor or administrative pastor or a pastor who exercises oversight in these ways, how does it help the lead pastor, which he was referring to, how is that a benefit to him? Because that seems to be a concern that they have at his church. Yeah, I mean, uh, often people will talk about it like leading from the second chair, right? Uh, with in, in that mentality, you know, lead pastor has the primary chair. They're helping set the vision uh, and the mission of the church, especially as, as they're founding the church. Um, and so as an XP or just any XP, your job is to come in and fulfill the mission and the vision of the church. So you're freeing up the, the lead pastor to focus on the preaching and the teaching, the counseling, right, and prayer. And so you're working behind the scenes with all the various staff and different levels to be moving towards that vision or yeah. to be to be just working and uh, moving towards that mission, fulfilling the mission that, that we're called to. And then you're making sure that every single aspect of the church is moving in that direction. Yeah. Because we can't have a mission of the church and then everyone's doing their own thing. Right. right? Everything needs to uh, be aligned with that, you know? And so even when we're reassessing, you know, we've been talking about a couple other uh, ministries that we have going on in the church, sat down with them and the, the stakeholders said, okay, this is the mission of the church. How are you working towards that? Right. Cause that, that, that needs to be discussed. Um, yeah. If the ministry that somebody is proposing doesn't, work towards the mission of the church and the way that you have, you know, oriented the church, then there's no point in doing that particular ministry there. Yeah. It's really got to fit that. And this isn't a weird thing, right? Because in any organization or any ministry, like uh, everybody has responsibilities, yep. right? And, and some of those responsibilities are unique uh, to certain roles. Therefore, if you can give them more time focusing on their responsibilities and not others, this is a good thing. And this is what an executive pastor in part, this is what an executive pastor does so well, is that they clearly define roles, responsibilities, make sure that things are working in that way, that uh, that people are, like Jimmy is a guy, is an executive pastor. Jimmy is a guy that will say, hey, uh, you didn't do this and you need to be doing this. Or you have no business doing this. Get off of that and mm -hmm. focus on your main thing. That's one of the things that you need as, 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 uh, as a church because most pastors that I know will tend to try to do too much and they need somebody to go, you don't need to be doing that stuff. We got other people that can do that. You need to focus on your things. And of course, then there are, sometimes there are pastors when they're just being lazy and they don't want to do things. You need an executive pastor to go, why aren't you doing that thing? That's your thing. Do mm -hmm, the thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. That's it. Exactly. Mm. So, uh, Jimmy, when do we leave for the fights? When do we leave them? Huh? Do we leave Thursday morning? <laughs> Is that when we're leaving? Actually, Thursday late morning. Okay, Thursday late because morning. Because you can't invent, you can't check in before two. Why? Two or three. Eh, it's just the way it goes. What do you the mean? Hotel. Oh, hotel. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go and you know yeah. sit around. What am I gonna do? Yeah. Go to a coffee shop. Yeah, the cabaret. There, yeah, I don't. It's in Vegas, right? Okay. It's in Vegas. I don't know where you go. I don't know what you do over there. I know that's why I plan it so I can go there and then I can check in, get relaxed, get a massage. Then, then we can head over to T-Mobile Arena because they're going to do the press conference on Thursday. Oh. Fridays, the the weigh-in or the ceremonial weigh-in, that's fun to go to. Okay, yep. Uh, Saturday night so here's what's going to happen. You guys are going to be listening to this, and I'm going to be, is he Thursday? I will be here in the office working. That's what's going to be. I'm not going to be on that plane. Why? Because uh, it's not going to work out. I want uh, it to work out. It'd be fun. I'd like to go. I'd like to go with okay, you, but I'm I don't want to. I don't, I don't think, I, So I, don't, I just don't. I I don't think Mark's going to be able to make it. I think you'll be able to make it. I will see. All right. Maybe I'll be in Vegas with Jimmy and Greg. And my dad. Ooh, I like him. And Izzy. Yeah, cool. Izzy's going to be there. Yeah. I'm going to have I'm going to have Conor McGregor sign my chest and I'm going to get the tattooed. Okay, I don't we don't have that poll. No, yeah, I'm, I'm you I don't have that, that pole. You act like you have that pole. No, no, no. Not you that act pole. like you have not, that pole. Not the Conor McGregor pole. Oh, you have John Jones pole. Yeah, but that's if John Jones is there. 
I don't want to go anymore. All right, good. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can follow us online on Instagram and Twitter at DocAdivo or on Facebook slash Dr. Ed Devotion. You can head to the website, DrDevotion.com. There you can contact us. You can sign up for the email blast at the store, JoeFoStore.com, and grab some gear. we got that fresh pod every Monday and Thursday. we got blog posts and video content over at the website. we got that all-access exclusive content. you got Banter Truth on Tuesdays, Weekday Wisdom, Monday through Friday. Head on over to DrDevotion.com slash all-access and sign up today. Later. Mm-hmm.